Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. While well, I'm beginning a new multi-part series today about the restoration of a very special piece of amateur radio gear. Let's get started. Regular viewers will certainly recognize this EF Johnson Viking Adventurer transmitter. Its distinctive square shape and dark color really stands out from all the other gray rectangular metal boxes around it. It's been quietly sitting behind me practically since the beginning of my channel. This particular adventure has a very personal connection to me, but before I get into that, I want to spend a few minutes talking about what the adventurer is for anyone who's not familiar with it. Shortly after its production launch in 1955, the Viking Adventurer quickly became a popular entry-level amateur radio transmitter. Manufactured by the E.F. Johnson Company, at $54.95 it was their least expensive amateur transmitter. It was only available as a user-assembled kit, unlike its bigger brothers which were available as kits and as factory-assembled units. Its design is very simple, consisting of just three vacuum tubes, a 5U4G rectifier, a 6AG7 oscillator and buffer, and an 807 final amp. Now because it was intended for use by the novice class license market of that era, by itself it was capable of only CW operation, and it required external plug-in crystals to set the transmission frequency. Higher class operators could plug in an external VFO instead of crystals and plug in an external modulator to enable AM voice operation. I couldn't find when the Adventurer went out of production, but because all tube gear eventually succumbed to solid state competition, I would guess it didn't survive past the 1960s. EF Johnson is still around today 100 years after their founding. They're a part of the JVC Kenwood Company and make commercial radios. However, they got out of the amateur radio market decades ago. I mentioned that this little guy has a personal connection to me. It originally belonged to my dad and it has an interesting story that goes back a few decades. My dad got his novice license in 1957 at the age of 18. Here he is in the early 1960s, shortly after acquiring a used national NC300 receiver. He picked up the Adventurer in 1963, and here it is in his evolving shack. That object on top of the NC300 is a salvaged Wurlitzer jukebox amplifier. He modified it to be the modulator input to the Adventurer for AM operation once he got his general class license. Jumping ahead now to the early 1970s, here's me giving the NC300 a listen. <laughs> I'm guessing I'm about three years old in these photos. Notice the Adventurer is still there. In fact, my dad kept building his shack around those two items for many years. Here's me again, probably now about five years old. The National and the Adventurer still served as his only transmit and receive equipment through the mid-1980s, along with a steadily improving AM modulator. By 1976, he'd added this beast, a homebrew VFO that he crafted from an old piece of Gates Harris hardware. That thing was massive. By pairing it with the Adventurer, he managed to achieve QST's Bicentennial Worked All States Award. Here's the collection of the 50 QSO cards that he saved. By the early 1980s, I'd picked up my dad's interest in ham radio, and with a lot of help and support from him, I managed to progress to get my general class license by the time I was 14. And he and I used this Adventurer and that NC300 and that brick house of a VFO to make quite a few QSOs back then. Unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of he and I using that setup. You gotta remember, that was the era of 35mm film and disposable flash bulbs and expensive and time-consuming film processing. So we just didn't take as many pictures back then as we do today. And also, neither that NC300 nor that VFO survived to 2023, so I'm just going to have to settle for restoring this adventurer. Let's begin the assessment with a tour of the exterior. The front panel is in good shape, considering the high mileage on the unit. The two-tone paint colors still look nice. This chicken head knob, though, is certainly not original. No idea why my dad replaced it. There's a little bit of wear and tear on the paint, especially by the two slide switches, and the power switch seems to be stuck. But all things considered, the front panel has held up very well over many decades of use. 
Let's have a look at the back. My dad substituted a UHF connector for the antenna connection. Now that's a very common mod. The original was a phono jack. Not sure what this other connector is for. And the power cord has been cut off. All 14 of the case screws are missing. And for sure, 14 are excessive. I guess EF Johnson hadn't heard of design for assembly back then. There's this additional meter that my dad added. I wonder if the stock meter quit working. Or maybe he wanted to monitor grid current and plate current at the same time during tuning. I'll have to check out the internal wiring and try to figure it out. Let's remove the case and take a peek inside. Like a lot of rigs, the easiest way to remove the case is to set the rig on its face and pull the case straight up. The top of the chassis looks generally okay. Everything seems to be present. There's some heavy deposits of brown residue. I can see where my dad tried to clean most of it off. Now that's definitely not nicotine. My dad was not a smoker. I'm guessing something blew up. Maybe the original electrolytic caps. Underneath the chassis, there's more evidence of a serious problem. There's a lot of that brown residue and it's mostly underneath the transformer. He definitely made quite a few mods over the years, including having replaced the power supply filter caps. I'll look more closely at all this stuff later. Jumping back topside, I noticed that there's no residue under the power transformer, but there's quite a bit of it around the filter choke and other nearby components. Also, the transformer seems to be newer, judging by the good looking paint. All of these clues are making me think that maybe the original transformer self-destructed and my dad replaced it at some point. Yet another clue is the damage on these two line power filter coils. They're charred almost like a blowtorch came out of the transformer power leads hole underneath them. Still another mystery is what's up with these two 1N4000 series diodes and two high power 100 ohm resistors. They might be there to replace the 5U4G rectifier tube but it's still wired in circuit and obviously still present in the rig. One end of the power filter caps is disconnected. Now these are clearly replacements. The original had two on either side of the filter choke. Now there's four with parallel balancing resistors. All right, so before I commit to this restoration, there are several critical items in this guy that I have to confirm are still good. If they're not, then it might just prove impossible or at the very least impractical from a cost standpoint to do this restoration. And on that list, naturally, is the power transformer. Okay, it's time to take a closer look at the main power transformer and confirm that there's nothing obviously wrong with it. And I'll talk about this setup here in a minute and why there's three meters connected up to the, uh, the Viking Adventurer. But I want to start with the schematic because before I hooked all this up, I did check for basic resistance, resistances, so hopefully this comes into to focus here. Uh, it's easy enough just to check the primary and the three secondaries. There were no surprises in the resistance values. No open circuits or shorts were evident, so that's good. I also did put my uh, LCR meter around the choke, the power supply choke. It's supposed to be, I think, around 10 Henry's. That's a common value. Apparently for these old power supplies, it's not listed on there and, and unfortunately the manual that I have for the adventure doesn't list the parameters, but it measured 9.3 Henry, so that's good. So it's passed this basic test, so a more advanced test is what I'm going to do here. And I've done something similar for my other projects where I just have the power transformer by itself with no load connected to it. I've disconnected all the old caps and it's just... Uh, Floating. There's nothing connected on the secondary side. And then I hooked up three meters. I've got this basic multimeter here that's looking at the 6.3 volt AC secondary. That's this guy here. Now that would ordinarily power when it's connected all the way up to the filaments on the 6AG7 and the 807. The second secondary is slightly lower than that one. It's around 5 volts and that's feeding the circuit for the 5U4G, that's for the filament um, uh, in the filaments rather in the 5U4G. And then of course the third circuit, that's the high voltage uh, secondary. The high voltage secondary I'm monitoring on my IM13, but I've only got one half of it. In other words, I've got the meter going from ground to one side of it, just looking at half. I'll look at the other half and be able to compare the two voltages and see if they're roughly the same. 
and the Keithley, I think I forgot to mention, that's what's looking at the 5 volt AC secondary. So I got both a filament uh, secondary voltages and the high voltage being monitored here. And then of course the dim bulb tester, that's what's providing a variable voltage and current limiting through the incandescent light bulb in case there's any problem. As, you, as usual, I'm looking in case there's any shorts here or something that goes wacky, it's not going to draw excessive current. Now one best practice that I like to do when I'm looking at high voltage gear like this is I don't probe around with my hand holding the probe. I've got leads connected up to all three meters so my hands stay away from the rig when I'm applying voltage to it. So with that said, let me turn on the dim bulb tester. I'm gonna slowly ramp up the voltage and see what I get here on these three secondaries. This item contains hazardous voltage and safety precautions must be followed. If you're following along and working on your own version, you're doing so at your own risk. So all three are starting to come up, that's good. I know you can't see it on screen right now, but I'm at about 40 volts AC going into the primary side of the transmitter. The bulb is not glowing, so I'm gonna keep going. About 70 volts, about 90 volts. I'll take it all the way up to 115, and let it stabilize. Okay, that's about 115, so I got seven volts AC on the higher of the two secondary filament um, uh, windings, 5.3 on the other one. Those look good. Now those are no load. Those are gonna come down, of course, when there's current drawn by those vacuum tubes, and it's actually fairly substantial current, so expect those to drop to, to be within spec when there's load on it. The high voltage secondary, I know you can't see it, it's pretty far away, but the meter is showing about 500, 520 volts. So that looks good, that looks like what you'd expect to be able to hit the target DC voltage once it goes through the rest of the uh, DC power supply. So that's, again, only one half of that high voltage secondary. I'm gonna turn the voltage down all the way. I'm gonna switch this connect and connection from this test lead so we can look at the other side. So let me turn it down and shut it off. Switch the lead. I'm showing zero volts on there so I can get in here and move this test lead now. All right, let's look at the second half of that secondary. I expect it to hit about 520 volts as well. If it doesn't, then that could indicate that there's some sort of imbalance in that transformer, some damage that maybe happened on one half. It's unlikely, but still it's easy enough to check and see that there's no big difference. And so looking again at the IM13, it's about 520 volts. So that's looking good. I think that this basic test is at least telling me that it's worthwhile to proceed with the rest of the rebuild of the power supply. Next up on the list of critical items is the band selector switch. And like most rigs of this era, the adventurer uses a complex multiple stack switch, two stacks in this case. The upside is the insulator is ceramic, which tends to indicate higher quality. But even the ceramic ones can wear out, especially from arcing. I'll give it a blast with a bit of contact cleaner, then check that each position is giving the correct switch logic. I cut off all of the connections to isolate it. I'd be replacing all the wiring anyway. And good news, the switch seems to be still working correctly. The final item of concern on the list of unobtainium replacements is the meter, which is easy to test just by applying controlled current through it. In this case, I put a 1K ohm resistor in series with it and use my adjustable DC power supply to modulate the current. It seems to work just fine, and for reference, full scale on this particular meter is about 9 milliamps. I also tested the added meter. It's an order of magnitude larger, 100 milliamps is full scale. So I dropped my series resistor to 100 ohms, and it also seems to be working just fine. I cannot finish the meter test without demonstrating just how bouncy it is. The meter on these adventurers are notorious for flopping around in the breeze. It makes for an interesting and almost comical experience for dipping the plate current, that's for sure. Finally, I'll need a good set of tubes and crystals to be able to use this rig. The tubes aren't that critical because you can still generally find replacements even today. But anyway, it looks like I won't need a new 5U4G, it tests out just fine. I also got good indications for the 6AG7. It also passes these basic tests. 
Unfortunately though, my Sen core is not capable of testing the 807. There's not a compatible socket for it. However, I've got an idea for testing it that I'll get into in the next episode. And in case it turns out to be a dud, no worries. I do have my dad's collection of over a dozen 807s that he saved over the years. I'm not sure if they're all usable, so I'll be running them all through the test that I'm working on. And as far as crystals go, no worries there. My dad had accumulated several dozen. Quite a few of them have fundamental frequencies right in the CW portion of the ham bands. Some of them have fundamentals that are outside the amateur bands, but they do have higher order harmonics that are usable. I like to make a short bullet list of the major things I want to achieve in any restoration project, so let's go through that list now. First and foremost, I want to try to return this to original factory performance for its intended use as a CW transmitter. Now, of course, that does not preclude from using it for AM operation. I'm just not going to have any added features to make that any different than the original factory design. I'm also going to do something I have never done yet on a restoration project, and that is completely strip it down to bare chassis. That means take everything off, all the wiring, the sockets, every bit of hardware, basically restore it to the way it was when it was a kit. That way I can effectively clean off all that residue. I'm going to discard and redo all of the wiring from scratch and then assess each component individually. Then I'm going to follow the original assembly manual instructions step by step to rebuild it. As I mentioned, I'm going to remove any of the modifications that are in there, with the exception of that second meter that my dad added. The more I look at that circuit, the more I'm convinced he added that for monitoring both grid and plate current at the same time. And of course, taking that meter out now would just leave a big gaping hole in the front panel, so it stays. I'm on the fence about replacing that 5U4G rectifier with solid state diodes. That tube is still available and the one I have seems to be working just fine. You can get them even brand new made by JJ and others. It is a fairly easy mod, but I'm kind of enamored with leaving the rig all still vacuum tubes, so we'll see. Now I am going to backtrack just a tiny bit about my statement about making this all factory original. And the reason I say that is I did run across an excellent website put out by Wireless Girl, amateur call sign AB2RA, and she has a lot of interesting details she's published on the adventure, including some common sense modifications, not the least of which is to move the plate meter circuit out of the anode to the cathode just so you don't have high voltage on the slide switch on the front panel. So that makes a lot of sense to me. So there may be a few tips that she has on her page that I will incorporate. We'll see as I get into the final decision process here. And then lastly, I'd love to be able to install a modern three-prong power cord socket on the back. They are so much more convenient than building a cord into a unit and obviously you get the benefit of the third wire ground to add safety to the unit at the same time. So that's my plan for restoring this guy. I think it'll make for a fun and interesting project, and I hope you guys stick with me as I go through it to the end and hopefully get this back on the air and make some CW contacts. So until next time, bye for now.